What's going on? Everybody okay? They got a call, said there was trouble in the house. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you all need to look around. It's a little wet for practice, don't you think? Don't the girls have schoolwork to do? They do their homework. Tundi's first in her class. Lynn and Isha are too. Now I don't even mind you saying we hard on these kids. You know why? Because we are. That's our job, to keep them off these streets. You want to check on the kids? Let's check on the kids. We got future doctors and lawyers, plus a couple tennis stars in this house. The chances of achieving the kind of success that you're talking about, it's just very, very unlikely. OK, you're making a mistake, but I'm going to let you make it. Watch me hit a few balls. All right. So tell me your names again. I'm Venus. I'm Serena. So what do you think? Hello, and welcome to Mix Presents Sound for Film and Television Awards season. I'm Tom Kenny, the editor of Mix Magazine, and we're here today to talk about King Richard. Uh, at one hand, a, a sports movie, a biopic movie, and at heart, a family drama. It was uh, premiered at Telluride uh, late September, and then in theaters, it's simultaneously on HBO Max on November 19th. Uh, and we're here today with Ron Bartlett. A recording mixer and Richard King, supervising sound editor and sound designer, uh, mixing the film, editing and mixing at Warner Brothers. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Uh, uh, Richard and Ron, you're, you both do a lot of big movies. Uh, you know, it's a far cry from The Dark Knight or The Master and Command or X Men. Uh, it's a tennis movie and where your typical library of sounds might be weapons and bullet buys and vehicles. We have tennis tennis ball impacts. We have sneakers on pavement, and we have uh, grunts and breathing. Uh, Richard, you've amassed an enormous library at this point of sounds. Did you, uh, how did you get tennis balls? How did it begin? We were lucky enough on the film to have some real tennis experts. Um, one of our producers, uh, I think, uh, played um, juniors uh, when he was younger. He was a, a semi-pro. Um, so he was great in being able to, um, to, uh, just kind of help us f facilitate getting a location to record and get a couple of tennis pros to hit the balls for us. And we, um, we went through the film and I, I don't know very much about tennis. I don't play, I don't watch the sport. So I had a big learning curve. Uh, apparently every time you hit a tennis ball, it sounds different. And there are all sorts of variables. Um, the type of racket, how tight the racket's strung, what kind of strings are on the racket, and obviously how hard the balls hit, if it's a, how new the ball is, if it's a dead ball or not. So we, we wanted to kind of trace this evolution of their, <clears throat> their playing style, their skill, and, um, and obviously the quality of the equipment. We started out with uh, wooden rackets that were strung kind of loose and dead balls um, in the very beginning when they're practicing in Compton. And um, we slowly, uh, and then introduced different things. We introduced different rackets, aluminum rackets, different, different string tension, uh, better balls, all the way up to carbon fiber rackets and brand new case of brand new balls. And we had two two pros, uh, one uh, one uh, a woman and a real big dude, like a guy who had really hit it hard. Yeah, and and uh, <clears throat> so we had a wide range, a huge library of different kinds of hits, uh, different proximities, um, and we recorded from pretty close up and simultaneously from about fifteen feet how, away. How do you mic that? How do you mic it with their? Impact well, the, the, the closer brig, the closer brig was was handheld, uh, as close to the ball hit as as John Fasal dared put the mics, and uh, the other uh, pair were um, about 12, 15 feet away on a mic stand, just to get a little bit of a you know a, a slap, a little bit of a dip, uh, distance. And this uh, this is all outdoors too. I mean, this is a, all outdoors. All yeah, outdoors. we got a we procured a. a, a, a friend of Tim, the producers, um, uh, has a private court in, in Bel Air. So we were able to use that court. It was fairly quiet. Uh, we, 
uh, didn't have too many noise issues. There was a pool, a pool pump and, you know, airplanes we had to stop for, the usual things, but um, very successful. And, and we got a world of material and, uh, and then began the process of figuring out, you know, what kind of hits should be here? How hard should it be? So there's an evolution by the time we get to the end of the film, she's hitting the ball really hard, really fast. And, um, uh, they both are actually both, uh, her and her opponent in the last match. Um, and it's not just her. You have a, I mean, at a certain point, you have these academy going on, right? You, you start to use tennis balls as backgrounds too. <laughs> at a certain point. Yeah. In the a lot of, a lot of those were recorded tennis games. So that they'd had that natural, first of all, the natural back and forth, the natural rhythm, as well as the natural sound, you know, the tennis balls had that slight, uh, um, they're very good at making a slap because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a transient, uh, hard sound. So they, uh, they, they tend when you're a little bit away from them to have a, to echo off something nearby. So there's a kind of specific sound to those. And, um, uh, yeah, a lot of tennis hits. Ron, Ron you've, uh, and then you sat them. in a console at some point, Ron, and had to mess with all those tennis hits, uh, and keep them alive, keep them moving. I mean, uh, what did you receive and how'd you start to hear it? Well, my partner, Josh Berger, who's uh, not with us today, but he mixed the sound effects. Um, he got to wrangle all of that, and which was uh, masterfully done. Uh, Richard supplied such great recordings. And it was really about, you know, molding and figuring out which ones, you know, shaping them to be in the right positions and the right perspectives. Uh, there's the closer hits, you know, when we're right on them or keeping the the slap, you know, on the background ones going I had production dialogue. Of course, it was recorded, you know, on the set, which was great. So it was about blending those two together and creating a good tapestry between the two. Um, there's a lot of scenes like in Florida where there's a lot going on. So we had to be careful not to overdo it and become distracting because your whole point in this story is sticking with those characters and really supporting you know, they're acting and, and the emotion that's going on. So the last thing you want to do is be adding all this commotion and things going on and, and distracting you, but you want to feel part of the environment as well. So it's a little tricky balance with that. Um, the same with uh, recording like group ADR and other things like that. Uh, these people off in the distance, there's be a group way over there and they're discussing a point or arguing about something. And then there's, you know, people cheering on the other side or like in the tennis matches, when uh, Venus first starts to go uh, into not, just before the juniors, even she does a couple of tournaments, and it's it's more smaller. It's much smaller with you know parents and a couple of kids, and so you have to have that type of you know texture going on that you don't overdo crowds, but you have enough people to support what you've got, uh, and then you're always adding just the right amount of reverb or slap to fit them in without them sounding just, you know, right, right up front ADR. And you have to like, you know, push them back into the scene a bit. So it was tricky, but really fun. That's part of the evolution. I mean, we go from these sort of chain link fences and you have to sweep the leaves off the court to these sort of pristine environments where you're in an audience. And, uh, and that's that sort of evolution of the court, uh, Richard, you must be conscious of that. It's, it's, it takes place in a relatively tight time period, but it's 19, what, uh, 94 or something? Or that 94 that we're talking about? Yeah, mid-90s. So uh, that in that year, she evolves. The streets of Compton sound very different than the Academy in Orlando. Uh, can you talk about that a bit? You know, Compton was, was, uh, was, a, a, was an still is, but was then a, um, a, uh, a fairly dangerous neighborhood, but it was also a neighborhood that just normal working people lived in. And, uh, you know, people would go to work every morning. And, um, uh, so we, we, we tried not to lay on the, the ghetto vibe too much. It's uh, more neighborhood. It's, it feels more neighborhood. Yeah. Really. It's more, it's more, it's more of a, a like a you know, lower middle-class neighborhood. And, and, um, um, but I think it was, it, it's, it's, it certainly was regarded by the police then. And, and I think a lot of the public as, uh, you know, just a no-go zone. 
<clears throat> and uh, this is the Rodney. So, you know, this we, is the Rodney King era, after all, as they show. I mean, it, it takes. Yeah, place. We, we we try to uh, to to you know it, it, it include that flavor of of um, uh, you know a lot of police activity, a lot of helicopters, sirens, um, with this vibe of kids playing ball on the street, an ice cream truck driving by, and you know, um, and then when they get to the 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 tonier clubs in, in and around uh, uh, LA um, and ultimately Florida, it's as you'd expect. It's polite tennis games in the background, uh, fairly quiet, bucolic, birds. Um, uh, a swim pool, a swim pool. <laughs> a swimming pool, quiet, quiet, uh, a polite voices. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of the, a lot of the, Ray really, you know, introduced that into the film when he directed it. This this sense of of uh, he, he kind of painted in a very nice picture visually of how each should look and and sort of feel. And there's an interesting um, thing when you go in their house too. There's a certain comfort inside their house. We don't spend a lot of time, but they gather as a family. They watch Cinderella. Yeah. Some of the noise disappears. Some of the cacophony. Yeah, and what you do here mostly is is like kids playing down the street or uh, a you know a friendly family dog barking. So just uh, you know sounds you hear in any neighborhood, in any place where you feel like home. Um, <clears throat> and then Florida has got its own vibe, which is I'm from Florida, so I know what it sounds like. A lot of mosquitoes, a lot of uh, bugs of all sorts, cicadas, cicadas all the time. Um, a lot of bird, tropical esque birds, uh, but nice birds, palm trees, nice birds, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 nice Floridian birds, and um, uh, so yeah, there's kind of those three main distinctions, and then we you know we go to the stadium at the end, uh, we're mostly either inside or outside in the arena, um, uh, not really, I mean, that's just more about that that stadium than that's, you know, that's a you know, big moment. That's the Coliseum in a sense. Um, it, it, it's that, that evolution sort of, and the wonder shows on the actress's face. I mean, by the time she walks into Florida or she walks into the Academy, these are extra worlds for her. Uh, Ron, from a mixed point of view, you have music to play with, you have all types of things playing, but establishing those type of worlds at the final mix. Uh, what are the, what are the tricks there? What, what do you look at? Well, I mean, Richard really supplied such a great dichotomy of tracks like that. You go from the streets and, and your uh, evolution into these, you know, really nice academies. So you have this, you know, very bucolic kind of vibe in Bel Air. And then you go into these, you know, big tennis arenas where it's just overwhelming. And, and you, you go for the really wide width of the crowd. And, and you know, it's stunning. And we really played with the... Um, tennis announcements as well to give you that size and that that uh overwhelming like you know because you watch venus's face when she walks in and they call her name and she's just like oh my god what's going on you know am i really here and and that was our goal to give you that sense put you in that space with her you know because i i always say you know that we really need to be with the actors and support them and not over the top of them in a way like you don't want to lead the witness so much so if you want to be with her and support her and and understand what it must be like for her to be in that space at that time and not you know be oppressive and and get ahead of the game so it's a balance of uh finding that sweet spot and, and, well, that's, that's real interesting. So for perspectives, because it's so much that they're this family, they're this family unit with a dad at the top and a, and mama too, mom equally at the top. Um, and yet she stands alone there in a way with confidence oh, yeah. when she walks in. Uh, and there's another moment, a couple like that, where the daughters sort of feel like I got to stand on my own. Uh, Richard, do you kind of comment on that, on that perspective sort of that we take in this movie? Um, well, we, I'm trying to think if we, um, I'll tell you one of the best scenes, uh, about that is not to jump in sorry but um <coughs> is um when venus is very upset that she's not able to play and they took her out 
and she's at night on the tennis court. And then Will Smith comes in as her dad and, and tries to talk with her about it. And she is steaming mad. She's smacking balls into him. And it's such a great scene. And Richard really set it up with backgrounds just perfectly. Like you felt alone, but you're at night and it's just, you know, this heavy moment for her. And, uh, and I have to say huge, huge props to Chris Bowers for the music because that score is just phenomenal. And uh, what he did was just genius. I mean, it, it allows you to just be right in there with her and you feel what she's feeling and you're just, Oh my God, it's so emotional. I mean, I think all of us felt that on the stage the first time we saw that scene and every time after that as well. And they have that talk and it's a very special moment. And uh, we did the same thing. It starts off with more backgrounds and a couple people down the way hitting. And then it just like slowly pulls in like this and it just pulls you into the film and that was the goal is to really isolate those two and just say, okay, it's just mom and daughter and they're working this out. And they, you know, and he gives that beautiful speech, you know, about how she's representing, you know, their entire race, you know, it's like a huge deal. And so he, he, he yeah, tells a it story was, there. He tells a lot. Absolutely. Story yeah. And, and that's, that's the moment where we need to be supportive and not on top of it. And it's easy to make that scene very sappy and go over the top with music and whatnot. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, the goal was to, again, be supportive and bring you up to that point and let the actors bring that home because their acting is just phenomenal in that scene. And, and Chris Bowers just did it so well. And I, it was just it, my pleasure to just guide it into the sweet spot for him because he, he delivered, you know, in space. It was so good. And, so. and we're going to get to his score because I, I agree with you. Uh, so Richard, do you care to add on to that scene? Because I, I'm glad you pointed that out, Rod. Uh, very powerful, very much focused. Uh, yeah, we just tried to pick a couple of sounds that would be in the background. Uh, there's there's crickets and there's, um, there's uh, one of those rainbird sprinklers, you know, that you hear all the time in Florida. A tennis game, maybe four courts over. So it's really sparse, uh, thin, um, uh, and yeah, like Ron said, it's a, it's an opportunity for them, the, the two of them, to have an intimate conversation about something really central to their lives. Um, and I concur with with Ron on Chris Bauer's score. It's uh, phenomenal throughout, and. Um, he did an amazing job. Let's talk. And, let's talk uh, about that a minute, then, because I've been in doing a number of these conversations over the last few days. I've never heard sort of more people talk about the weave of music and sound effects. I mean, it's it's really heightened. I, I know that you live it live it every day, but it, people want to talk about that dance. And I think his we have source, we have score, we have song. Um, uh, often unexpectedly play in the drama, play in the story, but just also very appropriate wherever it needed to be uh it's very solid do you want to richard when do you first start hearing music on something like this i mean what when do you know what you have well um i i see the final mix as the place to determine that dividing line and what i try to do is create a full three-dimensional world for the actors to inhabit and sort it out later because i don't want to I, I feel like a lot of times sound effects and backgrounds can work really well with music. I mean, you can hear both and you can dissect your mind. Your mind differentiates. Your mind knows that music is, is, is added onto the movie and your mind believes it knows that all these sounds that you're hearing were recorded the day that that movie was shot. So um, I, I think you can make that psychological adjustment. So I, I've always felt like, yeah, what, you can. Why not be able to hear everything? Why, why not? Why, why do you have to pull the, the sound effects out to hear the music? Everything can be up and audible, and you can appreciate, you know, the 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 world that you put the characters in, and the world that you kind of want the audience to inhabit with them for the duration of the film, and and also appreciate the music, which is sort of like an overlay of uh, of um, you know the the. The, the emotional intent 
Is it, it a matter? Is it a matter of sort of picking out a focus sound effect at that point to cut through? Is it a matter of stripping things away? And Ron, it could be. Yeah, it could be about about stripping out kind of the the uh, the uh, constant sounds, the, the 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 air and the and the you know the flat kind of traffic, and going more for specific sounds depending upon what the music cue is like. Um, uh, it, 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 yeah, it, it, it might be, it might be about modifying the sound effects mix a little bit to, to, to make that, to, to, to make your idea work. Ron, you brought up the music and you're, you're with it there at the end. Well, besides uh, lush, beautiful, wonderful, how, how do you see it working throughout sort of in the, in the, 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 the storytelling aspect of it? Uh, Cause we do have score sources song and, working with all of them there's a, a plethora of things to work with in that movie which were really well chosen uh pam martin our editor was a big part of that and uh and of course ray our director you know leading the way uh he set the stage and then allowing us to play with all the elements and and find our way through that was it was really fun because um like you said there are a lot of elements um you can take songs and they're playing as just energy like oh we're driving to the, go play tennis and it's fun and it's cool and it kind of fits you know it's this funky groove and it's great and they get there and it's all great you know pretty simple but what it does is it sets up a, a time and a place it sets up an energy and an attitude so it gives you all of these things of emotion without you really knowing it and it just kind of just playing along uh, and it's very psychological. It gets you to where you need to be and sets up the next scene. Uh, and then there's times where, yeah, the, you know, the gangsters come in and they're via you know, the boom box stuff and all that. And it's fairly typical, but it also goes with their character and it's very apropos. So that sets up, oh, you immediately know as soon as you hear that, uh oh, they're in trouble. Here comes some bad dudes. You know, you're going to have to deal with it. Yeah, it's it's very classic, but it works, you know. And so, um, but what Chris Bowers did is is be able to weave in and out of that with such beautiful textures, and it would sneak in, and maybe they would be playing on top of each other at moments, and then you pull one out, and then it reveals the score, and you're already into the emotion of the scene. So it's a real nice handoff, and that's that's the key to making such a, a great movie that that uh, Ray came up with here, and it's just. Uh, I love the way he did it and set up scenes and the, and the acting. Cause it, it just allows us to play with those uh, different textures and, and guide you through the emotions. You know, what Richard's uh, delivering is, is phenomenal for atmospheres, putting you in the place, you know, making things real and the realism of it. And then the music gives you that emotional content and, and takes you where you need to be emotionally. Um, and the source music kind of goes in between those in a way it does set up uh, moments where it's, you know, you're in that space. And then other times it's just a motor and it's keeping things fun and they're driving to go another tournament and they're laughing in the, in the van and they're playing it on the radio, for instance. But it also gives you that, uh, you know, they pick songs that were, you know, right at the right time in the nineties. And you're like, Oh, okay, cool. You know, that, I remember that song, yeah, and he kind of puts you in the right time and frame. So it's a, uh, it's a lot of different elements, and I know it sounds a little confusing, but it, it's uh, guiding you in, in, with the right levels. To wrap up, and if I, if you both provide a comment on this, that we tend to pay a lot of attention to big, huge action movies. You've worked on them a lot, you know. Uh, we we tend to focus on weapons and uh, vehicles, uh, uh, monsters. Uh, but the track of some of these dramas is equally challenging. And, and so you don't need a, a tennis ball hit for a sound person. It's the same as a bullet. <laughs> I hate to use that analogy, but these are the challenge is just the same. People think that a, somehow a, a huge action movie is harder uh, to get a tasty they, they, track. What do you think, Ron? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, they get overlooked a lot, you know, and, uh, Hey, every once in a while, I'll get a comment from somebody like, wow, that, that track sounded really good, like Cruella or, you know, some other movie that's not, you know, big guns or, you know, action like Dune or or even Heart of They Fall that Richard and I did, which, well, a very different 
take on things, which is still very creative. And a great and track. A lot. And a great track, too. <laughs> uh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Richard, what? <laughs> he went to town on that. Yeah. It was so good. But um, to the point of that is um, you're, you're very exposed in these kind of movies. And there's nothing else going on, and you have to pick just the right thing, and just the right car buy, the right you know tennis hits, and and it, you know you're you're putting out a movie that's about the best tennis players in the world or ever, with as far as female tennis players go. I mean, come on, you know it's Serena and Venus for Christ's sake. You better come up with the right tennis hits because there's so many fans out there, and they're going to know exactly what it sounds like, and they'll know if it's fake or not. So uh, Richard did his homework. He he recorded all the right stuff. He got pros to hit. I mean, that was you know really well done, and it was so important. I remember on the first temp dub. Remember Richard? It was like, oh, we got some work to do. We're gonna have to like go find the right stuff. I mean, he was using basic library stuff just to get through the first temp, and you know, it's just a it's a sketch saying, okay, here's where we're at. And this is what we need to do. And that's where he really learned the most about the film is you get to know the filmmaker. You know, I, you know we all knew the, the uh, film editor, Pam, but it's, it's about finding the voice of the film. And that was a huge part of it that Richard went and did his homework and did it right. Uh, Richard, the uh, kind of combat, I mean, some of my favorite tracks are Master and Commander, Dark Knight, Doug Kirk, these types of things. Uh, this is a wonderful track. Yeah, it, as Ron says, it's it's you don't have anything to hide behind, and and uh, I would say the same goes for for dialogue and ADR. He's he's really got Ron had his work cut out for him, just because of all the different locations, different levels of noise, and um, so a lot of work was done there. Uh, and then when we start to add sounds, everything is going to you know is going to be audible. So there. Uh, it, it really has to feel uh, feel totally natural and real, and nothing nothing added on. There's no uh, there's I think there's only one like non diegetic sound, subjective sound in the movie, one or two. Otherwise, it's straight up just reality. And I, I've always felt like you could just you could literally walk out in your backyard and just listen to all the sounds that are happening, and it's almost like music. I mean, th things weave in and out of each sounds, weave in and out of each other, different textures, different frequencies. Um, there's just so much great sound in the world. And even just in a street scene where the cars are driving by, there's dogs, there's kids playing, that could be a really rich, varied uh, environment. Uh, there was right? one scene there uh, where up there in the backyard and the, uh, her first coach comes back to talk to him because Richard's pulling him out of tournaments and the five children are just running around playing and you have this whole little scene playing on where he's trying to be super serious and you have a typical family's backyard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're, they're deciding yeah. the future of the greatest tennis player ever and they're just running around playing, you know? Yeah. And that's sort of the feel that yeah. has to come to there was that contrast in the film of, of these are just, these are just kids, yeah. you know, well, <laughs> uh, who had this, um, who had this, you know, gift, this amazing talent. And, um, but they're, yeah, they're just, at they're one just point he says, she's a 14 year old girl, you know, <laughs> he has to say the it. next two Michael Jordan, the next two Michael <laughs> <Jordans>. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and that's a nice segue. Thank you, gentlemen. A couple of Michael Jordans right here, too. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for the awards season event. And good luck on the shortlist, folks. Everybody go out and Thank vote. Thank you. Everybody. Yay. Thank you, Thank you all. Thanks very much.